This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Hi, thanks for tuning into the Arts Hour. I'm Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. This is the Arts Commission's weekly turn at the microphone here at MPB. Each week we have an in-depth discussion with a different creative Mississippian. We talk to artists, musicians, craftspeople, and people who help promote the arts in their community. Uh, today we're talking, we're going to be talking about a very special collection down in South Mississippi at the University of Southern Mississippi. And joining us today are Carolyn Brown and Ellen Ruffin. And y'all have a new book out called A DeGrumman Primer, Highlights of the Children's Literature Collection, about the DeGrumman Collection, that's based at University of Southern Mississippi. Ellen, why don't you start off and tell us about what it is and, and what, what it's contained. You're, well, I'm sorry, introduce yourself. Okay. <laughs> you are the curator yes. of the collection. I uh, apologize. I'm Ellen Ruffin, the curator of the DeGrumman Collection. And we're housed in McCain Library and Archives. So that will tell you immediately that the DeGrumman Collection is an archival collection. It is a children's literature collection, but it's not a children's library. It's more of a a research center about the history of children's literature and about the ways in which artists develop books and work with illustration and make their communication known with publishers through different markings on their art to tell them how to publish things. It's a fascinating collection. We have over 199,000 books that are children's books or related to children's literature. And our earliest imprint is a 1530 book. It's uh, an Aesop's fable. And then we have very contemporary materials. Publishers are good to us and send us books that will be old and rare in a hundred (laughs) years. And so, Carolyn, you've been on our show before. You uh, are uh, have done multiple books about different historic Mississippians for the University Press. So this new book, A DeGrumman Primer, how did you get involved in this? Right. So um, I have written four biographies of women, Mississippi women, all published by University Press of Mississippi. And after the publication of my uh, book about Kate Freeman Clark, the artist out of Holly Springs, I was looking for a new subject. And in the back of my mind, I had remembered Lena de Grumman because after I published my first book on Eudora Welty, I had met Ellen Ruffin, the curator of the de Grumman collection, because she had invited me to speak about the Welty book at their annual conference. And I was so impressed with that conference. This was in 2013. Just the people from all over the country that attended it, hundreds of people, all the fabulous materials that were on display, artwork, manuscripts. And I wondered who Lena de Grumman was. Who was this woman who founded this, the collection is named for? And so she was a person that had been on my mind as a possible book topic. So when I had the opportunity and this was like 2018, I guess, I drove down to Southern Miss to see if she was going to be a good subject for another biography. And when I got there, I realized very quickly that she only founded the collection. It was a second act for her. She was 65 when she came to Southern Miss. So it wasn't going to be a book length treatment. She was more of a chapter of a book about the collection. And I met with Ellen that day. I still remember this. And we were talking in the in the collection room. And I'm telling her about my book idea that University Press is on board with with whatever I want to do. And and could she help me? And she said, well, as a matter of fact, I've been talking to my colleague, Eric Tribunella, who's the third uh, collaborator on this project. And we've been talking about doing a book on the collection, maybe getting scholars of children's literature to write essays on the different uh, specialties, the things they can find in the collection. And we thought, well, maybe we can put this together. I could write the biographical chapter, which is 
actually how it laid out. And then we have 17 other chapters that were, we invited, and this is where Ellen and Eric created this part of the book, invited people they knew who have used the collection for their research, the, like the top names in children's literature, and um, to highlight what's special about the de Grumman collection. So um, that's how the book came to be. And I'm so it's a different project than what I've written in the past, since I'd never collaborated with others before, but I enjoyed it very much. And I served as an editor, editing all the essays that you can find in the book. But Lena de Grumman is a fascinating woman, and um, she has a great story. As I said, she was 65 when she was invited to Southern Miss, and it was a second act for her. Her first career was as a librarian, working her way up from a desk librarian to state supervisor of school libraries in Louisiana. And she was forced to retire. It was mandatory retirement uh, by the state at that time, and she wasn't ready to retire. I write in the book that retirement was not a word in her vocabulary. So she looked for something else to do, and the opportunity came with a Southern Miss asking her to come and teach children's literature. And she accepted, she moved to Hattiesburg. And this is another aspect of her story that I love, is that she was a teacher, and she was teaching a class that met once a week at night for four hours a night. And a lot of us have taught or been in classes like that, where the students were adults who were working all day, and they would drive up. Um, she wrote in an essay about this, upwards to 100 miles each way to take this class. And she respected that, and she wanted to make their time worthwhile. So she wanted to bring in show and tell items. That's literally how this all started, because she's a great teacher. And because of her connections as a librarian in Louisiana all those years, she knew some authors and illustrators, and she started writing to them and asking them to send her things, anything. Just She even said, if you're gonna throw that away, send the trash basket to me. And she would bring these items in uh, to show and share with her students. And this casual letter writing, what I call the letter writing campaign, became a more formal campaign in January 1966 when she started writing a, a letter on Southern Miss Letterhead, and she actually used the word collection. And she would write or type up to 100 letters a week, and she wasn't afraid to contact anybody, like the greatest names at the time. And she sent these letters out, and she started hearing back from uh, the Haters, Berta and Elmer Hader, the Rays, of course, authors of Curious George, and they were all enthusiastic uh, to send her uh, materials. They said they'd be happy to. And what was really exciting were the letters themselves were the treasures, I think. I think, of course, Ellen, there are many treasures in the de Grumman collection, but these letters in the book, you can see the images uh, are decorated in these authors and illustrators' signature styles. For instance, Curious George making his way to Hattiesburg. You're listening to the Arts Hour. Our guests today are Carolyn Brown and Ellen Ruffin, and we're talking about the new book they collaborated on, A de Grumman Primer, Highlights from the Children's Literature Collection, which is the de Grumman Collection at University of Southern Mississippi. So Ellen, talk about some of those early successes that, that, that de Grumman had in terms of, I was just amazed at those, num that those numbers that she said like the low was like 100 letters a week, but she would go much higher than that. Right? Oh, yeah. 300 and 400 letters a week, which astounded me. For the longest time, I would say, oh, she wrote three and 400 letters a month. And I think it was Carolyn who pointed it out to me that it was a week. And she kept records of it. And Carolyn very carefully kept notes and, and saw how she documented every visit, every letter, whom she responded to, what she said, where they were. And then she would make these visits to meet the people. This cracks me up because I would love to have this opportunity to just have the university fund my trip to New York and I would just, you know, place myself in a hotel 
in the center of Manhattan and then give them times to come by and meet with me. And she did that, and they were happy to do it. They were appreciative of the fact that she was making something out of their art. Most of these people were classically trained artists, and this was their way of making money. You know, at that point, illustration was not as well respected as it is now. Uh, I don't know if I should say it wasn't as well respected, but it didn't have the command that it has now. Uh, now, illustrators make money <laughs> off of their work, and they can do all kinds of gicle prints and things that will sell in the marketplace. And, and children's books at that time were probably just seen as, you know, like chaff. You know, the kid reads it, and it, it wasn't seen as important as we look back now and we say, oh, Curious George, what a foundational, work. you know, like it was just right. kitty stuff, right? Well, and I think an example of that is we have several in the collection, the big little books. These are books that my mother remembered. My mother died in 2013 at age 91, but they are small, maybe three inches by five inches, maybe not even that big, and they're thick, and they are not on acid-free paper, so they crumble, <laughs> and people were careless with, I mean, children were reading them, and, and they would fall apart, so now those things are very rare, and we have quite a few, and I'm so thankful that we do, because they come from donations of people who found them in their homes or perhaps collected them themselves. But you're right, children's literature was not a scholarly entity. Uh, I think the Children's Literature Association came about in 1972, I believe. And that is a group comprised of English professors who actually do the scholarly work with children's books. And I, there was one other thing I was going to mention, and that's golden books. When I was a child, you know, I loved to go to the A&P with my parents and, and plant myself right at the newsstand where those golden books were. And I loved them because they were 25 cents, and I could often wring that much money out of my parents to to get a book. And the books, those golden books, which are just classics in and of themselves. They started in 1942, and not only were they affordable, but they had the best authors and illustrators doing the work. So they've all become valuable. And there's a large chunk of them in your collection, correct? Yes, right. yes. We have a great collection of golden books, okay. uh, Some of all of the originals. This is Larry Morrissey. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show is broadcast on MPB's statewide radio network on Sundays at 5 p.m. For access to all our past shows, please subscribe to the Arts Hour on your favorite podcasting app. Allison Walker, the lady auto mechanic, host of AutoCorrect. If you're enjoying this podcast, try my podcast, AutoCorrect. We help steer you in the right direction with your car problems. Find me on any podcast platform or at autocorrect.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. We're back on the Arts Hour. I'm Larry Morrissey, and our guests today are Carolyn Brown and Ellen Ruffin. They are co-authors of A DeGrumman Primer, or Primer, if you will, Highlights of the Children's Literature Collection, which is the DeGrumman Collection at University of Southern Mississippi. So in the last section, we were talking about DeGrumman and her background, and then she really built quickly on kind of her successes. And one of the things 
that she started, which still exists, is the uh, the Children's Literature Festival that that came out of the DeGremmon collection. So, Carolyn, maybe talk about the origins of that and and maybe the early years. 1966 is when she started officially sending the collection letter, and a lot of people contributed because she made two points in that letter that I think spoke to a lot of the authors and illustrators she was contacting. One, that she was going, the materials were going to get into the hands of all children in Mississippi. And the second was that it was a tax deductible donation. And so a lot of them did not know that. And that was a big reason they wanted to contribute. So the collection continued to build and build uh, over the years, 66, 67. And in 68, she realized, I think, she had the makings of enough material that she could have a festival and it was called the Children's Book Festival. And it attracted, I, I call Lena de Grumman an ambassador for Mississippi. And I think the festival is a good example of how she got the word out and getting the word out about the festival and inviting people all over the country, even though she knew maybe a lot of them would not come, she was still advertising, marketing and getting the word out. But a lot of people did come. And in the book, I have some letters of people who had such a wonderful time and they were, you know, praised the festival and praised Hattiesburg and the university for how warm and generous and wonderful the whole weekend had been. And it just made me feel good. I felt here's a woman who's just doing a whole lot for our state during a decade when a lot of times Mississippi wasn't in the news for the right reasons. And and now the festival has been going on ever since uh, and grown. Ellen can tell you us more about how it's changed over the time. It has kept the Southern hospitality that Lena uh, envisioned and It is a true celebration of children's literature. We bring in the best people in the world to speak to teachers, authors, illustrators, librarians, professors. It it runs the gamut. I'm trying to think of some of the names of the people who have every year a medallion is awarded to someone for their contributions in the field of children's literature. And the first person to win that was in 1968, I think. Was it 69? Was it 69? Uh, Lois Lenski, who had won a Newberry for Strawberry Girl and is, you know, was known all over the place. Most recently, well, a few years ago, we had Captain Underpants. Dave Pilkey came to campus And I will tell you, we had to rent the USM Coliseum to be able to house the the kids. Teachers were writing to us immediately saying, can we bring our classes? Can we bring our classes? And we envisioned a nightmare, but we all, we had a team to run it. We had volunteers all over the place. And he was amazing. He gave time and he signed every book. He gave each kid a gift certificate to Books A Million so, so that they could buy a book of their choice. But we've also had Judy Bloom. We've had Rita Garcia Williams just last year. We've had uh, I, I wish I had the list in front of me. I could, there Paul Zelensky, who did the, the cover book. of the book. Yeah, the the list is in the book. It's a, uh, it, it's it's amazing. But I mean, these are just some of the yeah. su- the biggest legends of kind of children's books in the last, you know, since the the origin of the award. It's pretty. It's amazing. really incredible, yeah. and the fact that they've come to Mississippi and they've spoken to the people, and I will tell you, it has been without exception an amazing experience each year manages to top the last one and we have an amazing thing with the Ezra Jack Keats award and that is interestingly enough the reflection of someone who has received a lifetime achievement award recognition we have in the Ezra Jack Keats award someone who 
is beginning a career and wins a national award, a Keats Award, and they come, and it's sort of like being at the Caldecott or the Newberry Banquet. It's very moving. Well, it is kind of, I guess, a one-stop shop to kind of meet a lot of people that, and, and up-and-coming writers and as well, if you were a, a, a writer-to-be or whatever. I know of people who've gone because of that. You oh, know? yes. Yeah. And, you know, right now is a great time to be a Mississippian in children's literature because uh, Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters has implemented a youth award, and uh, we have top notch writers in Mississippi in the children's literature area. You're listening to the Arts Hour. I'm Larry Morrissey, and our guests today are Carolyn Brown and Ellen Ruffin, co-authors of a DeGrumman primer, or primer, however you will, (laughs) highlights of the children's literature collection at USM. Carolyn, let's talk about the book itself. So it starts with kind of a historical element, and then it, it branches out into kind of looking at different aspects of children's literature and then connecting it to the collection. So maybe you could kind of give us, there's there's many, many chapters, but maybe you could give give us some overview of it a little bit. So uh, I wish Eric was here, our third colleague. I want to remember him. He, this was really his area of expertise along with Ellen, but we invited different children's literature scholars in these various fields and they knew who the top scholars were in areas like fairy tales and folk tales and the golden books like we talked about earlier and of course the the rays who people have come down to the degrumman to do research on the rays and other notable authors in the collection and contemporary children's authors and 19th century periodicals. I mean, it goes on and on. It's a fabulous range of topics, and they're all very kind of short, page and a half, two page essays that just get to the heart of how the de Grumman excels in these specialties and why, it, what makes it really special. And Ellen mentioned earlier, like the earliest imprints at Aesop's Fable. So we have a great chapter on horn books and battle doors to. St- kind of start that gives you a great historical perspective on what you can find in the collection all the way up to contemporary literature where we have manuscript pages from you know John Green who's so popular today so it shows you what um, Lena was able to start and what Ellen is continuing to do in, in collecting fabulous authors papers uh, so you can learn about the process Eric himself wrote a fascinating chapter on variants of the same book. So, for instance, there's an image in the book of many editions of The Secret Garden over time. And, um, And it's really fascinating how, like, he talks about how little women changed language, like little word choices affect as we went further in time how you would change a word or phrase because it might have been considered racist earlier and you're trying to clean it up. And it really can change your reading of a story when, a, when certain words are changed. So I thought that chapter was really interesting. Uh, so yeah, it gives you a great, um, it's a great introduction, just what the word primer means. It's an introduction to what you can find at the de Grumman collection, but it, I think it's only that. It's a just an introduction, but it makes the book appealing to both the general reader, which I always feel my books are targeting the general reader, but also scholars who might not be familiar with the collection yet. And, and on the scholarship side, Ellen, I was interested in, in, in several of the chapters kind of pointing out how um, social historians can use these oh, yeah. things as, as, a, as a source to kind of see opinion and I, I, concepts and stuff of a certain time period. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's one of my favorite things about the collection and having a history professor bring his class in and using primary sources from the collection to examine the history of childhood, how children were perceived, how they were treated, how women were perceived, what their careers were. You know, we we don't weed. We have careers that only women did in the 1900s and then 
uh, only men could be bankers, only women could be nurses. We've seen so much change in the last several hundred years, but it is a lot of fun to watch students examine those books and it's fun for me to see the things they notice because often they notice things that I have passed over. I might have noticed it initially, but they bring out some interesting things and it's such a good experience for them to write about. What are some, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, so the, the, the de Grumman collection is also kind of a source for scholars who are doing, you know, pretty deep research. Maybe you could give some examples of recent uh, projects that have come through and what their what their focuses were and how they use the collection. Oh yeah, that's a great question too. We have several books that were that used the collection. There's one called Civil Childhood, and it's all about a black child's life and what images were available to them prior to civil rights and but it's it's also contemporary as well and there was one fascinating topic a guy from Harvard came down and did research in the Keats papers because Ezra Jack Keats used the backdrop for his work was tenement houses the city maybe not beautiful glorious images, but he managed to capture the color and life in the tenement houses in New York. And he saw a playground, and children were finally introduced to an urban background. It wasn't this um, beautiful countryside and, yeah, pastoral uh, examination. And the the whole reason the guy used the Keats stuff is he was uh, getting a Ph.D. in humanities, I think, and it was to study neighborhood and the influence on children and their lives. So one of my favorite projects, and Carolyn knows this, is a film about H.A. and Margaret Ray that was done by a graduate of NYU, a young woman from Japan. And she had come to NYU, gotten a a degree in film, and had learned that H.A. and Margaret Ray had escaped the Holocaust with, on bicycle, riding with the papers of Curious George on their backs. And so she was fascinated by that, and she thought, all of her life, she had thought they were Japanese. She had no idea they were German, they were Jewish. She knew nothing. And she came to the collection, I think, about six times, and did research, and Uh, produced the film Monkey Business, the true story of the creators of Curious George. It's a film that's about, it's a documentary. It's free on Hulu, and it's so well done. I can't recommend it enough. This is Larry Morrissey. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show is broadcast on MPB's statewide radio network on Sundays at 5 p.m. For access to all our past shows, please subscribe to the Arts Hour on your favorite podcasting app. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, You can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Okay, we're back on our for our third and final segment of the Arts Hour today. My guests today are Carolyn Brown and Ellen Ruffin, and they are both two of the three co-authors of A DeGroman Primer, or Primer, 
highlights of the children's literature collection, which is the DeGrumman Children's Literature Collection at USM. Sidebar here for a second, and maybe you could each talk about, Carolyn, maybe you could start and talk about either a specific item in the collection or, a, you know, like a, an author's collection within there that is was especially interesting or meaningful to you. For me, it's the letters that I found. I'm a big fan of letters and people writing letters because I believe it's a lost art and um, I couldn't have written any of my books without letters and journals that have been left behind of the people I've written biographies of and so the fabulous letters that de Grumman received from the authors that she contacted uh, the the two I mentioned earlier the haters wrote her letters that they illustrated with beautiful images and the one from the rays with curious george making his way to hattiesburg and then there's two letters from J.R.R. token that are really interesting because uh he forgot to sign the first one and on in the first letter he says i'm so sorry i forgot i don't have anything to send you and it's on his letterhead and then he must have realized after he mailed it that he didn't sign it so they have a second letter and he says, I'm so sorry I didn't sign the first letter. And he signs this one, but he still never sends anything. <laughs> but we do have the two letters in the collection on his letterhead. So those are my favorites. I also am very fond of the image on the cover of our book, which is by Paul Zielinski. And that's a funny story because I, ever since I spoke at the festival, the Children's Book Festival, I've been on their Christmas card list they send a Christmas card every year. And so one year, I think it was 2017 or 18, they sent this image on our cover by Zelensky uh, out as the Christmas card. And I saved it because I just saved Christmas cards that I like. And when we were debating what image to put on the cover, I found it. I happened to find it. And I said, do you remember this image, Ellen? Do you remember this Christmas card? And Anyway, we decided it would be perfect because it has a D and a G in it, and it's so whimsical and colorful and, and just brilliant. Is it from a book, or is it something no, you did? No, did it for you. It's a doodle. Oh, my goodness. It's, that's his version of, of a, a doodle. doodle. It's very <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> and he's won, uh, I think, two Caldecotts. I know he's won one and a Calde two Caldecott honors. He is an extraordinary artist. And uh, so we were thrilled with that image. Yeah. And thrilled to have it on the book. It just so happened that UPM liked it as much as yeah. we did yeah. and decided to use it. Yeah. Ellen, how about you? What, what's, what's one of your favorites? I have to tell you, this is a very difficult question for me because I discover favorite things all the time. And one of the favorite things is the stuff from Emily Blackmore Stapp, who was an Iowan who moved to Wiggins, Mississippi toward the end of her life. And she had sort of galvanized children in World War I to collect pennies for war orphans. And we have all of this stuff that she saved, and she had moved to Wiggins because her brother-in-law had started the lumber industry in, in Wiggins in that area. And he had also given some land to Piney Wood School. So there are so many interesting connections with that general collection. But if I were to say my favorite thing, it is the correspondence, a piece of correspondence between Esfer Slobodkina, the author illustrator of Caps for Sale, which is one of my favorite books, and I recommend it for everybody, and also Margaret Wise Brown. They had collaborated on books. They had been published by Powell. William Powell was their publisher. And Esfer Slobodkina writes Margaret and writes to William Powell complaining about the way the clerk at Lord and Taylor handed her her book. She'd gone to Lord and Taylor in, in the book section, and there was this young clerk behind the desk, and she asked for her book, and the clerk just sort of disinterestedly pulled it up from the bottom of the 
shelves and thrust it at S. First Lobedkina, and somehow this became her publisher's fault. And so the letter is all this, you know, reaming him out for his lack of support and appreciation for his talent. And so she has copied it and sent it to Margaret Wise Brown. And up on the top corner, she hand wrote, Margaret, I haven't sent this yet. Should I? And Margaret Wise Brown on the other corner said, Fira, I suggest you build a roaring fire using this for kindling, get two bottles of red wine, and relax. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to see, and I have to admit, the correspondence yeah, is one of my personal. favorite things. You're listening to the Arts Hour. Our guests today are Carolyn Brown and Ellen Ruffin. They are two of the three collaborators who put together a DeGrumman primer or primer, highlights of the children's literature collection that's just come out on University Press of Mississippi. Ellen, maybe you could tell us about what we heard about DeGrumman and how she collected things with, through this massive letter writing campaign. What are the strategies or how do you get things uh, for the collection to these days? Well, it's a, a, it's a similar approach in developing relationships with authors and illustrators. And one thing I learned from reading Lena's correspondence is she became friends with those people. She was interested in their lives. We have the correspondence with Madeline Lingle where you hear stories of what's going on with Madeline Lingle's children and certainly Margaret and H.A. Ray, that correspondence begins, Dear Mrs. de Grummond, and it ends with Dear Lena, we're so sorry we missed you. And so their correspondence developed a, a friendship. And of course we use email a lot with that. And it is always good to be where children's authors and illustrators are. And, you know, I try not to be obnoxious, but I'm certain I am, because there are places people can give their papers everywhere. So it's a, it's a, a real honor when someone decides to give their papers to DeGrumman. Now, I have to say, we have a good reputation for being a fine collection that cares and takes care of the archive and the papers of the authors and illustrators. And we also uh, have exhibits periodically, and we do things to promote the work of the authors and illustrators. We have a bi-yearly newsletter that gives a lot of information about the collection and about different pieces in the collection or different aspects of the collection. So we're not shrinking violets in going after the papers of authors and illustrators. However, we do know that authors and illustrators can make money with their work. So it's not quite the same climate that right. Lena had. Right, these original works, original illustrations for a, a, a popular book, I imagine, would be tremendously valuable, like a, well, a yeah. piece of artwork, yeah. They so she, are. Yeah. And one of the ones I'm thinking of, Lauren Long is a great illustrator, and he did the Obama picture book. And boy, would I love to have that. <laughs> I've talked to him several times. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. One of the things that also I thought, like kind of in later in the book when you're talking about kind of more contemporary world is the kind of um, just how much this world has grown. And Carolyn, I guess through your your past books, you've, your books for University Press were, although they, I think they are great introductions for all readers, their market, I mean, the initial marketing was kind of like a juvenile readers, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So Tell about your experiences kind of a little bit maybe in that world of it just seems like it must be a massive <laughs> scrum these days because everybody seems to want to write a children's book. Yeah. So I did start out thinking I was writing a children's book. I actually, when I was writing the Welty book, I thought I did want to write not a picture book, but a young reader biography. And I realized quickly it's really hard. Uh, I went to a 
the SCBWI, right? Society it's of Children's Book, Book Writers and Illustrators, which is a big organization where you could get in front of an agent. And I brought a manuscript and a chapter and got time with an agent. And I remember her saying, I like this, but this is not what I'm publishing right now. I mean, nonfiction was like not getting me anywhere in the children's book world. And then I realized I, my style of writing, I mean, I'm a PhD and I just have an act more academic style. I, it was very hard to change my voice. And so I started, wrote my book in my voice, which was, as you said, an introduction with, but with footnotes and with pictures, but I thought anybody can read this. And I did in my mind have maybe high school uh, age it could be used if they were doing a unit on wealthy for instance and I had success with that but what happened was when the book started selling when University Press did market it as young adult that is on the wealthy book they realized a lot of adults were buying it that it was a popular right. book with just the general audience no age required and Not everybody so, wants to read the seven to eight hundred exactly. biography. You and know with me. all respect to Suzanne Mars, right. uh, you know, who's my mentor, I think there's room in biography for the different lengths of books. And if you want more, you read Suzanne's book and you'll have everything you want. And it's funny, the same thing's happening with Margaret Walker right now. I wrote the, you know, 150 page biography of Margaret Walker, but Mary Emma Graham, who's the scholar of Margaret Walker, former student of hers, read my book, signed off on it, said, Carolyn, you did a great job. She's coming out with the 800-page Margaret Walker book, hopefully at the end of this year. So I feel like it's a, a genre that has room for, and, and you know, there are baby biographies now, you know, all these different levels of biography. So, um, yeah, my experience does draw me to DeGrumman and to children's literature. I have great respect for the field, having tried to write on a younger level and, and not being able to do it successfully. Well, before we get out of here, let's, I, I want to uh, spend a minute just letting you all talk about stuff you've got going. So, Carolyn, for, for folks who don't know, tell us about your other books and, and, and where people can find out about them. Right. Thank you. Um, so I've written three other biographies, all with University Press of Mississippi, and they're available on their website as well as at Lemuria Bookstore here in Jackson or on Amazon. I have a page on Amazon. And the first book was called A Daring Life, which is a biography of Eudora Welty. The second one was uh, called Song of My Life, which is a biography of Margaret Walker, uh, the African-American writer from Jackson as well, who I have to say I knew nothing about before I moved to Jackson. And that book was my education as to who she was. She's the author of Jubilee, uh, as well as many other poems and essays. And my third book, I decided there wasn't another literary lady I wanted to cover at the time, so I did a book on Kate Freeman Clark, the great American Impressionist, student of William Merritt Chase's, uh, who's from Holly Springs, Mississippi, and there's a gallery there of her work. And that book, interesting, I feel like there's been this you know, pathway, but that book was our model for the DeGrumman primer book. Uh, in terms of size and the way we laid out the images, actually Pete Halverson over at University Press of Mississippi was involved with the Kate Freeman Clark book and he was the main art designer of our, the DeGrumman book. And shout, I wanna give a shout out to Pete because we think yeah. the press did a beautiful job with the publishing of this book. Ellen, so uh, the DeGrumman Collection, um, y'all are going to be involved with the upcoming uh, Mississippi Book Festival in Jackson. Yes, Tell us yes. about what you're going to be doing with that. Thank you for that. Um, well, we'll have a panel of several people who have contributed chapters to uh, a DeGrumman Primer, Highlights of the Children's Literature Collection, along with Carolyn and Eric, and um, that'll be interesting. And we're going to have an exhibit in the rotunda of the Capitol highlighting some of the images. We'll bring the artifacts and have them in the rotunda. Then... 2021 is the 80th birthday of 
that little monkey who has traveled around the world, Curious George. And so we're going to have a birthday party for George with the children's activities. George himself will be uh, there. So children can have their pictures taken with George and all of that kind of stuff. And actually, we're going to have, and, and this is just going to be online, you can enter this if you choose to, we're going to have an 80-mile walk from September th through middle November. Uh, so to give people enough time to accumulate 80 miles, and you'll get a pretty nifty t-shirt as a reward with an original illustration from H.A. Ray on it. And uh, it'll be a good way to give recognition to those 80 years George has spent on the earth. This is Larry Morrissey. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show is broadcast on MPB's statewide radio network on Sundays at 5 p.m. For access to all our past shows, please subscribe to the Arts Hour on your favorite podcasting app. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app.